some idea of the content. So I'm just going to dive into it. Um, since Rob, you already did a nice introduction. Um, first, I want to just say a few things about the mission of the Schiller Institute and of the LaRouche movement, uh, which has been in existence for almost half a century. Uh, I've, only, I've been a member of it for about 15 years. Um, but our mission is to establish a new, just, uh, international economic order for the world. Uh, and it has to be on, on the basis of what we call the common aims of man. Uh, and what that means is that uh, there must be mutual respect and cooperation among nations. And it must be based on the idea that human creativity is the actual driver of economic prosperity and growth. Now, over the years, this idea has had uh, different manifestations. Back in the 1970s, uh, we had the proposal for the International Development Bank uh, as a way of extending credit, particularly to, to the underdeveloped nations. Um, so that idea circulated broadly, uh, especially amongst the non-aligned movement nations. Um, around the end of the Cold War, uh, we introduced this idea of the Eurasian land bridge or the Iron Silk Road. Um, that idea was to create uh, development corridors throughout the Eurasian landmass uh, to promote connectivity uh, and development along those uh, corridors, particularly the internal parts of that continent. And, and again, the idea was that nations would collaborate uh, in, in a mutual development. This idea became reality uh, in 2013 when Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, officially launched the Belt and Road Initiative as the official policy of China. Uh, he actually did that in Kazakhstan. Uh, and so now this is not an idea anymore, it's real. The Chinese are going for it. They have their own, um, they have their own names for things. You know, they, they have this idea of win-win cooperation. Um, but in light of that, our organization has, under Helga Zeppelrush's leadership, we've reinvigorated our international campaign for a new economic order. And that's what Robbie means when she refers to the new paradigm. So the Chinese, they, they give us coverage. They put Helga in their newspapers and they interview her on television. So this is being talked about. Um, now, one thing that Helga LaRouche has stated is that uh, there are some problems getting Western nations, Western policymakers, Western thinkers to actually understand what the new paradigm is, or to understand what the Chinese intention is with the Belt and Road Initiative. And one of the problems, uh, the main problem she brings up is that Westerners are trapped in the idea of geopolitics. Uh, they're, they're trapped in this idea that nations are, are selfish and their interests go against the interests of other nations. Um, and the outgrowth of that is this, this system of alliances where certain nations say we're allies and they say those other nations are enemies. Uh, so you have ingrained this, this old system of alliances and power blocks. And that gets in the way of cooperation, particularly when it comes to nations in Europe, uh, nations in the U.S., like the U.S. or Canada, for that matter. I'm an American, by the way, so don't hold it against me. Don't hold it against me. Um, you know, when you talk about working with China or Russia, you know, they, this becomes a problem. Um, and a lot of this thinking, while it is rooted in uh, 19th century British designs for managing their empire. Uh, there is a specific um, expression of it that's rooted in the Cold War. And that's why this presentation is called Cold War Therapy, because we really have, some people haven't let go uh, of that way of thinking. Um, so, Helga Zeppelrush uh, identifies uh, an organization called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, as a, a root 
reason why people are having this problem. Um, so we're going to talk about that later. Uh, because a new paradigm exists outside of geopolitics. Uh, it, it's like trying to, um, trying to understand the new paradigm from the standpoint of geopolitics is like trying to square the circle. You can't do it. The, the circle is incommensurate to the square. So you actually have to bring in a higher geometry to comprehend the circle. Um, in order for us to think that way, uh, it would behoove us to look at the ideas of Friedrich Schiller, specifically his collection of 27 letters called On the Aesthetic Education of Man. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight, uh, this presentation is essentially broken up into two parts. One of them will cover uh, the, a lot of the period after the, uh, the Cold War, the, the immediate period after the Cold War. Um, and then uh, the second part, we'll go through the uh, ideas of Schiller. Um, but before I do that, I do want to say something about Franklin Roosevelt, uh, because there, ha there has to be a very clear understanding of what Franklin Roosevelt represented. And that actually will provide a foundation for understanding uh, the turn that took place in our nation. Um, because there's a lot of um, misconceptions about Roosevelt. Um, a lot of misconceptions. You know, some people say he was a Keynesian. Some people say he was a socialist. Some people say he was pragmatic. Uh, some people say his policies, his domestic policies, extended the Depression. Uh, there's an author, Ben Stein, who wrote a book a few years ago on the Bretton Woods Conference. And Stein, who did a lot of research on it, uh, the book is actually interesting because it talks about the fights between John Keynes and Roosevelt's representative, Harry Dexter White. Stein claims that Franklin Roosevelt cared nothing about international economy. Uh, Frank, that Roosevelt was only interested in fighting the war. So all these things are stated, and my response is that all of these people, all of these statements are just totally wrong and off the mark. Uh, to understand Franklin Roosevelt, you have to recognize that he in terms of his philosophy, is a Republican with a, with a lowercase r. Uh, he, he's a, he represents the Republican tradition of Plato, uh, the best tradition of Europe in terms of statecraft, and I mean specifically the idea that the purpose of government is to serve the common good uh, of the people. That that is the, the, the best idea from Europe in terms of statecraft. And Franklin Roosevelt embodied that idea. That that's why government exists, is to serve the public interest. <coughs> and that's in opposition to the, to the view that the purpose of government is simply to maintain order. Because there is that kind of thing. And you can extend from this idea that it exists just to maintain order to the idea that it exists to maintain a static social order where you have a certain group of people at the top, uh, what we refer to them as elites or oligarchs, and you have <coughs> most of humanity beneath them, and we have to maintain that kind of structure. So we refer to that outlook as oligarchy. So that's really the fight, and you have to understand Franklin Roosevelt as representing the Republican tradition, lowercase r, just in case people get confused. We're not talking political parties, we're talking philosophies. Now, something else about FDR that has to be understood is that uh, he was very keenly aware um, that the world wars of the 20th century were the result of the brutal system, the, the brutal political economic system of, of European empires. He was very aware of this. Um, he was also very keenly aware of the British role uh, in terms of geopolitical manipulation. Um, and a as a result of this, he, he had a, a certain idea of what was going to be necessary to maintain a stable peace after the war. 
Uh, and one of those, well, one of the things he understood is that number one, the United States is going to have to have good relations with the the uh, USSR, and it's going to have to cooperate with them. And in fact, people may not know this. When the USSR was first established, the United States did not recognize uh, the government. It wasn't until Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1933 that we officially recognized the USSR. Um, the other thing about Roosevelt is that he had the idea that if we're going to have a stable peace, we're going to have to break up the political economic system uh, that dominated the transatlantic nations. Um, what I mean, I guess a well, specific expression of this is the system of cartels, trade arrangements uh, uh, that were established uh, by private interests based in uh, London, Wall Street, Germany, Sweden, Italy, France. Uh, Roosevelt understood that we had to break up uh, this system of cartels and, and private interests that, that, that control all the major points of production, control the resource wealth, uh, that, that established a system of colonialism where they extracted resource wealth from faraway places and exploited the labor of peoples in India and in Africa and in Asia, all over the world, and, and didn't do anything to uh, reinvest and, and give back to these people. Roosevelt wanted to break that up. Um, so this was a, uh, this outlook was reflected uh, in a number of ways. Uh, it actually was reflected at the Bretton Woods Conference. I'm not going to talk about that. I, I did want to mention it. Like, that could be a story for a different day. What I want to bring up is how it was reflected in the design for the occupation government uh, in Germany by the United States. Um, for those that don't know the history, after the Germans surrendered, Germany was split into four occupation zones. One was controlled by the Soviet Union, one controlled by France, one controlled by the British, and one controlled by the US. Uh, so we had to issue provisions for how we were going to administer our, our occupation zone. Uh, the document that did this was called a JCS, Joint Chiefs of Staff 1067. And the discussion about the substance of it, you know, that was going on in 1944. The actual issuance of the document was April 1945, which was the year, or not the year, the month that Roosevelt died. Um, however, a lot of his thinking was still stamped on it, so to speak. And then Truman signed it in uh, May of the next month. It was initially classified, however, by October of that year, they made it public. Um, and what I'm going to sh show here may surprise people. One of the provisions of this uh, directive from the President of the United States to the commander of the U.S. occupation forces in Germany uh, said that you will take no steps to aid uh, towards the economic rehabilitation of Germany or be designed to maintain or strengthen the German economy. Hmm. That might seem contrary to how we're accustomed to thinking. I think we're probably accustomed to thinking, well, don't we want to go in there and rebuild and get everything going again? Well, ultimately, that is the objective. The objective of fighting the war is to win a lasting peace. However, before we do that, we have to take care of a few things. One of them is denazification. Uh, and denazification does not just mean rounding up Nazi party officials or generals in the, in the Wehrmacht. Oh, that is part of the denazification because one of the things the occupation government has to do is put people into local posts, regional administrative posts. You also have to put people to manage companies. And so the other part of denazification also included 
identifying people that gave significant material support, financial support uh, to the Nazis. Actually, what, what it says, I'll read what it says. Uh, persons are to be treated uh, as active supporters of Nazism or militarism when they have voluntarily given substantial moral or material support or political assistance of any kind to the Nazi party or Nazi officials or leaders. So, just go back to this idea um, that you have this, this political weaponry <coughs> system. Uh, well, actually, I'll give you a story. This is something Franklin Roosevelt said to his son, Elliot, uh, right before the signing of the Atlanta Charter. His son was actually with FDR. Uh, because they were preparing to meet with Winston Churchill. And they, Roosevelt already knew that Churchill was going to try to egg them on to, to declare war on the Nazis and have the U.S. forces go into Europe. And you know, Roosevelt is, is contemplating this, but at the same time, he makes the point to his son, you know, the British and the Germans, they've uh, pretty much controlled a lot of the trade, and they've pretty much controlled a lot of the international markets. And they were doing this before the, before the war, before, before both world wars and between the wars, and they might have designs to be doing it after. So, his thinking is that you cannot have the same people managing the, the, uh, the major industrial corporations, the raw materials firms. You cannot simply take these people and put them back in charge of their, their companies because they are responsible for the rise of the Nazi war machine. So this was very important. So you have to get these people out of there. So one of the things they set up uh, was, uh, they called it the detroxalization branch of the, uh, of the occupation government. And the idea was to break up those arrangements, uh, to decentralize the, the economic system, to make it so that one guy isn't sitting on the board of several corporations. Um, because again, this system existed before World War I, between the World Wars, and if you're going to have a stable peace, is it really going to happen if it, if it, if it, exists, if it exists after, given their role in uh, doing things like supporting Hitler? Um, so the, the guy who was the chief of this branch his name is uh, James Stuart Martin. And his job, well, a lot of what he had to do in his team was run around Europe and uh, gather documents, gather files, uh, go into places like IG Farben, and just get as much of what they had on the record as he could. And you know, fortunately for him and his team, a lot of the German companies were, were very meticulous about record keeping. Um, so he did a lot of that work. And what did he find out? Well, he had the good fortune when he was in Luxembourg, April 1945, of getting access to the files of the steel cartels of Europe. Because they were all housed in one location in Luxembourg. Uh, and some of the authorities there goofed and let him and his team have at it with files. So he, they had a treasure trove and they were finding out all kinds of stuff. Um, one of the things they found out was a connection between a bank called J.H. Stein and the steel cartels. And the fellow who ran that bank was named Baron von Schroeder, or Kurt von Schroeder. And a lot of his clients were the who's who of, of uh, Western German industry, what they call it the Ruhr, that, that region. Was a lot, you had a lot of heavy industry there, a lot of capital industry, uh, coal, <laughs> steel, iron, all kinds of stuff, like electrical equipment. A lot, a lot of these corporations, his bank, they were, uh, they were clients of his bank. Um, and so, uh, his bank, also his, uh, his cousin Bruno uh, was also a banker, and he ran the Schroeder Bank in London, and he, wrote, he ran the Schroeder Bank Corporation in, in New York City. 
Uh, and there was a lot of uh, uh, intertwining of business between the Schroders, so in a way where you almost couldn't tell who was running what. But anywho, so uh, they got a, uh, they were able to identify uh, uh, Kurt Schroeder von Schroeder's residence in Bonn. Uh, and they tried going to the actual bank, but unfortunately it was uh, the bank vault and the files were sitting under like 20 feet of rubble, so they couldn't get those. But luckily, they had it, the address for his via in Bonn. They went there, and when they got inside, they saw stacks of files and records four feet high uh, filling up a room near a fireplace. But fortunately, nobody bothered to burn them. So they got to looking through these files, and one of the things they found as well was what they found, they found letters. And one of the uh, persons who was writing to von Schroeder was Heinrich Himmler, who was the head of the SS. And the letters were, as Martin described, very monotonous. <laughs> they were interesting but monotonous. And every letter that Himmler wrote to von Schroeder he was asking for money. And he wasn't asking for chump change. He was asking for hundreds of thousands of marks. He was asking for millions of marks. So he's asking for some big time money. Uh, something else they found uh, amongst von Schroeder's bank records were um, they found ledger deposits. They had ledger deposit records. And one of them was very interesting. It was called uh, hopefully I can do my German correctly. Suter, uh, Suter Kunto S, or Special Account S. I might have butchered the German. Um, and this account had about 30 to 40 depositors. And most of them were some of the biggest, most well-known directors of a lot of the big German uh, industrial corporations. So they were all putting money into this Special Account S. Now, they, they, what they also found was a very close relationship between withdrawals from this account and the letters from Himmler. So, what they pieced together was that this account, special account S, was really the running account for the SS that von Schroeder was keeping in his bank. And Martin also surmise that if there's a special account S, there's probably a special account A, special account B, special account C, D, maybe even all the way up to Z, and even beyond. So th this is the kind of thing that, through Martin, the, the decartelization branch, their commitment to busting up the, this cartel system, this is what they were discovering. Now, a month later, May of 45, uh, there was a, a chance encounter at the uh, VI Fugel, which is the home of Adolf Krupp. What were they doing at the home of Adolf Krupp? Well, after, in the post-war period, or whenever you would conquer territory, oftentimes you set up military headquarters at some of these fancy estates. So that's why they were there. Uh, Martin was with his American executive officer, a guy named uh, Major Ernst Ophels. And um, they were having breakfast at, along with the two people pictured here. Per so Percy Mills, who was the uh, director of economic affairs for the British Control Council. That's like the administrators of the British zone in Germany. And he was with his counterpart, General William H. Draper, who was also an investment banker for Dylan Reed and Company. Now, it should be noted that Dylan Reed, his bank, they actually uh, sold a lot of the bonds uh, that were made possible in the 1920s through the Dawes plan, I believe. Um, they did sell the bonds, maybe. I, I believe it was through the Dawes plan. That, created the arrangement, where, where Germany was able to sell bonds internationally. Uh, and the selling of those bonds actually resulted in the building up of the German industrial machine, which went on to do a lot of other things. So 
So uh, he's a general now. He's been a general for, I think, since the late 30s. Um, and they're sitting together having breakfast. And uh, Major Ophels, the, uh, Martin's executive officer, is, is telling a story about something that happened the day before. He said that uh, the security branch of the occupation government, they were screening a lot of the uh, servants. And they actually found out that uh, a laundry woman was a member of the Nazi party. So they, had, they got rid of her. She was no longer a, a laundry woman in that villa. And so he makes the comment, he says, I want to read it, I want to make sure I get it right. He was very, this is awful, he, he found it very curious to see so much effort devoted to removing a washerwoman. When men like Edward and Hudramont Wilhelm Tengelmann, Heinrich Dinkelbach, and Hugo Stinnes were still running around loose keeping their jobs. Now, who are the people that he named? Hugo Stinnes, he was a major German uh, coal magnate, steel magnate, shipping. Uh, Dinkelbach, he was the chairman of United Steel. And the other two guys were people of similar stature. So he made that statement. And this caused Sir Percy Mills to wheel around and say, what's wrong with them? They weren't Nazis. They are businessmen. Ophels, in response, just kind of casually starts relating to Sir Percy Mills what they were finding through their work looking through these files. And all this did was it made Percy Mills a lot more agitated. So at a certain point, uh, General Draper just kind of cuts off the discussion by treating Major uh, Ophels like a subordinate. So that was the end of that discussion. Now let's fast forward about a, a year and a half later. This is uh, December 7th, 1946, fifth anniversary of Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Commerce Secretary of the United States, Admiral Herman, uh, deploys Philip D. Lee, who's the chairman of General Electric, to Berlin. And he, he's sending Reed there because Harriman wants to find out what can commerce do to help the economic program of the occupation government. What, what can we do? So they send Reed. Uh, Reed meets with, uh, with, uh, with uh, General Draper and uh, James Martin and another fellow named Richard Spencer. Who was a, um, he's a, uh, he worked in the legal division of the Control Council, which uh, um, Draper, Draper wants the engineering frame, so he's with Draper. So they all meet with Philip Reed, who's on his, I guess it's a fact-finding mission, and they meet for about a half an hour, and the first 25 minutes of the meeting is dominated by General Draper and by Richard Spencer, and what they essentially do is they attack the decarbonization policy, they attack the denunciation policy, they, they attack the trading with the Enemy Act, and they basically make the case that this is all stopping the recovery. This is hampering the, the effort to get the economy going, and we got to stop this. They don't bother to mention to read that this is the actual official policy coming from the President of the United States to the occupation government. So after about you know, 25 minutes of that, Draper kind of turns over to Martin and says to Reed, oh, well, well, Mr. Martin has his own views, so we should probably listen to him. Uh, and so Martin, with about you know five minutes before everybody goes and runs off to lunch, tries to talk about what he's doing. And meanwhile, uh, Draper and Spencer are just interjecting at any moment. So it, it shouldn't be surprising, just kind of by what I'm recounting, that when Reed writes his report and submits it to uh, Harriman, that in the report he's attacking the decarbonization policy. He attacks the denazification policy, and he, he says that these things are bad for the recovery of Germany. So, so uh, in the next year, more help comes. Herbert Hoover travels to Berlin to help. Uh, he's there to, uh, to assess the state of agriculture in Germany. He, he ends up writing a report. Uh, Ex-President Hoover? Yeah, Herbert Hoover. 
Well, just remember, right now they're rehabilitating George W. Bush. So, yeah. <laughs> so here's her, Herbert Hoover, flown in. Um, he issues a report, and uh, his report says we should make concessions to the old line financiers and industrialists because these guys have tremendous management skills and they can help with the recovery. That was his report. And he, he also says that attempts at reform are a deterrent to recovery. So that was Herbert Hoover's report. And then also in that year, Lewis H. Brown, who was a, he was the chairman of a um, uh, John Mandel Corporation, which they uh, produce asbestos products. Yeah. It was also a company that was part of the Morgan Group. So he was, he went to uh, Berlin, apparently at the invitation of General Lucius Clay, who was the supreme commander of the occupation forces. So he, he ran the occupation government, Lucius Clay. So Brown was brought in, and Brown produced something called a report on Germany. And this report recommended that German industry, controlled by its former managers, should be built up into a powerful bulwark against Russia. So that's Louis Brown's report. About a, uh, a year later, March 1948, this is General Lucius Clay, who's, again, he's the supreme, he's, he's the commander of the uh, occupation government, occupation forces. By March of 1948, uh, Clay issues a memo basically scrapping the decarbonization policy. They liquidate uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of the branch, they, fire, they get rid of a lot of the employees, they say that we will no longer try to reorganize heavy industry and capital industry. We'll just, we'll just focus on looking for unfair trade practices. That, that's all we'll do. He also initiates the uh, recommendations of Lewis Brown's report, which would become what we call the Marshall Plan. I gotta pause right there because people should digest that. I'll also mention that Helga Zeppel Rouge doesn't like us referencing the Marshall Plan. We talked about doing things like rebuilding Syria. Uh, because she says for some it has a lot of geopolitical connotations to it. Um, so that was the end of uh, decarbonization and denazification. So we're going to uh, have a radical change of gears here. This is, a, uh, this is General Reinhard, <laughs> Major General of the Wehrmacht, specialist in intelligence of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. So you know, he dealt with the Eastern Front. Now, in the latter stages of <laughs> World War II on, in the European theater, Galen would meet with Hitler and would report a, a very bleak situation on the Eastern Front. And it was true. In April of 1945, Hitler dismisses Reinhard Galen. In the end of that month, as the Allies are closing in on Berlin, Galen calls a meeting of his closest, most trusted staff members. He, he's preparing for Allied victory. And what he does is he orders them to take all the files they have on the Soviets, take all the Soviet intelligence files, and bury them in the Bavarian Mountains. And they follow suit. So, in a matter of, you know, within about two weeks, 
Germany would surrender. And about a month after his staff meeting, Reinhard Galen turned himself in May 22nd to the U.S. forces uh, in Germany. Again, that's uh, May, May 22nd, 1945. In the summer of 1946, Reinhard Galen returns to Germany. I said returns because between him surrendering and him returning to Germany, he was actually brought to the United States. And again, think about what's going on at the end of 1945 and the Nuremberg Prize. When he returns to Germany in the summer of 1946, he's on the payroll of the Pentagon. And they've actually tasked him with the mission of building up a, an intelligence network to gather intelligence on the Soviet Union. And Galen, because he is an intelligence expert, he goes to work at it. Uh, he actually recruits a very vast spy network. Um, in fact, his network becomes a primary source for U.S. military intelligence uh, on the Soviet Union uh, in and around Germany. Um, it should also be noted that by, for the most part, the people that Reinhard Galen was recruiting were ex-Nazis and war criminals. Uh, amongst the people he recruited was a fellow named Klaus Barbie, also known as the Butcher of Vienna. You know. um, I don't want to say too much more about him. I just that's a name people know. They may not. It, Reinhard Galen may not be a household name. Neither is Barbie. People that follow this stuff probably know who he is. Um, uh, in 1949, you know, about three years after uh, uh, Galen begins work building the spy network, uh, two things happen. One, you have the formation of, of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, and again, this is a the collective security arrangement is made on the basis of, of the threat of the Soviet invasion of Western Europe. Uh, the other thing that happens in 1949 is the CIA comes in and they pick up Galen's spy network. So he's no longer working for the Pentagon, is working for the CIA. Um, it should also be noted that the intelligence that Galen is giving, whether it was to the Pentagon or to the CIA, uh, is largely talking about the Soviet threat. Um, when the Soviets came into Czechoslovakia uh, in that period, uh, Galen was reporting that the Soviet troops are fresh. Uh, their, the, the Soviet presence is very well built up. And invasion is imminent. And we've got to be prepared. That was, that was the quality of the intelligence that, that he was uh, you know, giving to the Pentagon and ultimately NATO, because of, uh, a lot of the raw intelligence that NATO was getting came from his network, uh, like two thirds of the intelligence came from from his network. Um, there's a certain irony, though, in the fact that the United States kept this guy on the payroll. Uh, that irony is the fact that, you know, we're supposed to be concerned about the Soviet threat, yet the Soviets very easily penetrated the spy network. Very easily. And the way it worked was, you know, the Soviets knew who his people were. They already had a thousand. And the war wasn't that long ago. All they had to do was have one of their agents approach one of the spies and say, hey, we know who you are. We know who you are. You can work for us. You don't want to work for us? Well, we're going to turn you in. So the Galen network was heavily infiltrated. A lot, it was heavily infiltrated, all kinds of double agents. Even his chief, Galen's chief, was a, was a Soviet mole. So, I mean, the CIA picks up this agency, 
knowing this is going on, in fact, they had the CIA spied on, on, his, on his network. Yet, you know, we, we kept them on the payroll. Now, in 1956, this is after uh, West Germany is established as, a, uh, as an independent nation. In 1956, the Galen spy organization is morphed and transformed into the official intelligence service of West Germany, what we call the BND. So, um, I'm going to add one more thing uh, about the Galen case because a lot of the classifieds, a lot of classified CIA documents from the Cold War period have been released. Uh, and there was a push by the uh, uh, New York Congresswoman uh, to have a lot of the, the paperclip related stuff released. And, and there were files that the CIA had on Galen uh, that had been released, like in the last 20 years. Uh, and when people started reviewing it, it was quite stunning. What it actually showed was that our analysts at the CIA at the time, back you know, during the late, the early 50s, looking at his intelligence and getting an assessment of it, back then we were saying his stuff is garbage. This guy is falsifying reports, exaggerating reports, he's exaggerating the Soviet threat, his intelligence is useless. That's what our analysts were saying back when Galen was active uh, on our payroll, uh, helping us to fight the Soviet threat. So again, that's what the declassified uh, files show. And that was just like in the last 20 years or so. So now we're going to have another radical change of gears. We're going to uh, go back to uh, 1945. Um, where it's March, or actually 1949. March 1949, uh, we're in New York City. We're at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and there's a lot of commotion uh, in front of the hotel. There's a lot of picketers, uh, a bunch of right-wing groups, uh, American Legion, Catholic groups, some Patriot groups, and it starts out small, uh, but in, in the days Afterwards, it would swell into a bigger demonstration. Uh, there's another commotion going on on the 10th floor of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. There's a rival suite, uh, suite 1042. And it's a very unusual booking uh, because whoever is in there, uh, as soon as they, they got there, made immediate calls to the front desk for extra tables, extra phones. Uh, they started sending wire messages, a bunch of wire messages out uh, immediately. Uh, they're constantly calling for room service, uh, people ordering steaks, side orders, uh, bottles of claret, bottles of beer, buckets of ice, non-stop uh, room service. And for the waiters that are waiting on this room, bringing up all these orders, when they open the door, they see something very strange. Uh, they walk into a, a cigarette smoke-filled room. There is telephone wires webbing the ground. Uh, on the other end of these wires are people on telephone receivers having these very animated phone calls. Uh, they see secretaries taking notes for people, like two or three secretaries. Uh, in the bathroom is a guy with a mimeograph machine. And then there's papers everywhere. So there's all kinds of commotion. Now, at the center of room 1042 is New York University philosophy professor Sidney Hook. Uh, he's, in the, he's in the middle of all this, and he's not very concerned about all, all the, the food being ordered and all the commotion. He's not concerned at all. He's hard at work. Um, and the people that are with him in the room uh, are, are, some of these people are journalists, some of them are writers. There's a musician, Nicholas Novakov, <coughs> Russian musician, who became American. Uh, there's also a, 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 a labor figure, a fellow who is associated with the, the, garment, the ladies' garment workers, who is strangely 
in this room of artists and Davinsky? Davinsky, correct. Davinsky. See, that's yeah, somebody who knows who he is. See, I wasn't going to mention him because I didn't think it was going to be him. Yeah, no, I was here. It was just sort of a bitch at the beginning anyway. Oh, no, that's, that's great. Yes, Davinsky. Thank you, Stuart. I can, I can mention him by name. Davinsky. Davinsky, yeah. So they're all, anyway, he's kind of a, an odd presence amongst the, the intellects, the, 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 the writers, the authors, and the musicians. So they're in there. Uh, these guys are busy doing Lord knows what. And there's something else going on in the ballroom on the first floor of the wall of the story. Uh, prep the final preparations are being made for the cultural and scientific uh, conference for world peace, uh, which is being held in the ballroom. And they're expecting about a thousand or so delegates. And some of the people attending are some very prominent artistic figures, uh, like Arthur Miller, for example. Uh, Leonard Bernstein is, is going to be attending. Uh, Langston Hughes, Clifford Burgett, a lot of you know very prominent people. And as they're walking by the picketers outside, the picketers are screaming at them, uh, you know, calling them uh, uh, commie sympathizers. Now, what the main beef of the picketers outside is that all of these people going into this conference are, are, are not going to a peace conference. They're actually going to a, a communist front. That this is not about peace, this is about communist subversion of America. And so the picketers are out there in a rage, and they're, they're partly right, actually. Um, whether it's subversive or not, I don't know. Whether, it's, whether they do want to actually have a dialogue, maybe. Um, however, this conference was initiated by the Communist International. So, in one respect, you might say they're right, but is it really that bad? I don't know. Uh, either way, they're there to protest, and the people in room 1042 are there also to disrupt the conference, but they want nothing to do with the people outside. Uh, as far as Sidney Hook is concerned, if somebody's going to expose a communist front, it's not going to be a bunch of reactionaries. So he's there with the mission, and he has a, an idea of how it needs to be done. Now, something to be mentioned about Hook and the people associated with him in this, in this bridal school. All of these people used to be communists. They were all fellow travelers. However, they all broke at a certain point from communism. In Hook's case, uh, you had the uh, Moscow trials. You know, where Stalin went after a lot of his opposition, <coughs> and you know that that was a shock for Sidney Hook. But then there was also the uh, Soviet Nazi non-aggression pact. That was the the end for Sidney Hook and his association with communism. And that also holds for a lot of the people that were joining him in, in this bridal suite. Because what they were what they were there to do is run an agitprop campaign against the conference. And they actually had a lot of success. They were, they were actually able to uh, intercept mail uh, going into the conference. Uh, they were actually able to successfully doctor press statements to make it appear as if the conference was putting it out, but they really wrote, wrote the stuff. And then they had all kinds of other ideas about how they would go into the front of the ball, where the ballroom is with a bunch of umbrellas and start banging umbrellas on the floor and tying themselves to chairs so that they just wanted to create a big stink a big commotion and just bust up the conference. However, they were a little surprised um, at the fact that the conference organizers did allow them into some of the sessions and actually gave them room to ask questions. Uh, and a lot of it was, you know, kind of silly. Um, however, there was a chance uh, uh, encounter between Dmitry Shostakovich, who was part of the Soviet delegation, to the conference, and Nicholas Nabolkov, who was one of uh, uh, Sidney Hook's uh, cohorts. And uh, this is what... Is that the writer? They're both musicians. Huh? They're musicians. Okay. So this is what uh, Nabolkov does, because uh, they're having a music forum. And you know, Sasha Kovic was you know, there, as part of the music panel. So Nabolkov uh, uh, asks the question, he says, on such and such a date, and at number X of Pravda, 
appeared an unsigned article that had all the looks of an editorial. It concerned three Western composers, Paul Hindemith, Arno Schoenberg, and Igor Stravinsky. In this article, they were branded, all three of them, as obscurantists, decadent bourgeois formalists, and lackeys of imperialist capitalism. <laughs> the performance of their music should therefore be prohibited in the USSR. Does Mr. Shostakovich personally agree with this official view as printed in Pravda? So that was Nabokov's big intervention. And it actually was big because it created a stir. Like all the Soviet delegates were screaming, uh, provocateur! He's a provocateur! And Shostakovich, he wasn't actually quite comfortable being at this event. He, he was kind of edgy the whole time. And this is probably why, because he, he probably thought, thought he was going to be put in such an awkward position. So before he answers the question, he has to consult his uh, Soviet entourage. And then he gets back to the mic and he says, I agree in full with the statement and problem. Now, that was a big blow, uh, or I guess a big win for Hook and his crew, uh, getting Shostakovich to do that. Um, because one of the things that also happened uh, was a lot of press coverage of the peace conference uh, was basically saying this is a, this is a commie conference. Uh, the people inside are commie sympathizers. Um, there was a, actually, Life magazine had a two-page spread where they took photos of 50 of the prominent participants uh, and just accused them of participating in a communist front. And again, these are, you know, very you know, significant literary figures. You know, you, you can't the quality of the image is such. Einstein is yeah, right. Yeah, I was going to name something. Yeah, there's Einstein. You can recognize him. That's Langston Hughes. There's Arthur Miller. Leonard Bernstein is on here somewhere. So he had a bunch of these, you know, big deal uh, authors and writers and scientists and whatnot. Um, so, yeah, but it's a comic conference, so they got attacked. Uh, so Sidney Hook and his team, you know, they, they did a good job. They busted up the conference. They exposed uh, Shostakovich. Uh, you know, they, they were happy with themselves. They, they did a good job. And after this peace conference is over, the, the Bridal Suite team went to Freedom House, which is in Manhattan. Uh, and they were there to celebrate their, their great victory. Uh, and as they were celebrating their great victory, Nicholas Nabokov, who did the intervention with Sostakovich, is giving a speech. And in the middle of the speech, he stops and he says, oh, Hey, I see my friend over there. Oh, there, there's my friend from when I when I was uh, in Berlin. Uh, Nabokov actually worked for the uh, occupation government for the U.S. in Berlin. So, so he recognized his friend from that period, a guy named Michael Josselson. So Michael Josselson gets up and he walks towards Nabokov and he says, "Oh, this is quite a splendid affair you have going on. We should have something like this in Berlin." And Nabokov agrees. Now, who is Michael Josselson? Because this is not a coincidence.